Hare Krishna, everyone, and welcome back once again to our ongoing series on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pacharine Nivishesha Shunyavari Pastrita Deshatarane All glories to Sri Prabhupada. <coughs> So we are continuing with our mini-series on stimulation for ecstatic love. And today we will be doing uh, part 73. In this lecture, I would like to cover the life and poetry of another very prominent Brajbasi poet named Parmananda Das. Parmananda Das uh, is one of the famous eight prominent poets in the line of Balabacharya called, as we explained in other lectures, the Astachap, Astachaps. He was born uh, in a very prominent Brahminical family in the city of Kanauj, uh, in present day Uttar Pradesh. <coughs> I was reading Kanauj is famous for its um, fragrant oils and incense since time immemorial. Nowadays it's known as the perfume capital of India. And in the Ramayana, Mahabharat, and the Puranas, it's referred to as Kanyakubja. Kanyakubja. So Kanauj is especially famous for Ruha Gula, uh, which is the concentrated fragrance of roses, Chaiti Gula, which is the fragrance of pink roses, which grow only in March, April, Miti Petri Chor. Miti Atar is a, a, a fragrance similar is described to one that is experienced when the first drops of rain fall on parched earth. Try to imagine that. Uh, it's famous for chameli or, or jasmine oils and chandan, sandalwood oils. Now around the 16th century, the king of Kanauj at that time, he was a Rajarishi, a saintly person sitting on the throne. And he called a meeting with all the principal brahmanas of the land and asked them to arrange that all the people <coughs> in his vast kingdom would have access to transcendental knowledge. Now, the future parents of our Parmananda Das were living elsewhere at the time, <coughs> but after hearing about this king's desire, they came and settled in Kanauj. Parmananda Das's father was a very learned and highly respected pandit, but unfortunately he was poor, as brahmanas sometimes are. But when his son, Paramananda, was born, a very wealthy Vaishya businessman came and gave a large amount of gold coins to his father in celebration of the birth of his son, with the hope that he would also become a learned scholar and share his knowledge with the people in the kingdom of Kanauj. I was thinking, just like in modern times, wealthy families give endowments to universities to further education and society. I was remembering one time we invited uh, the president of this country many years ago, Nelson Mandela, to a program that we were hosting called the Festival for the Ch Children of the Rainbow Nation. And in his address to the audience, there was 100,000 children there, actually. Um, Nelson Mandela referred to education. He said, <coughs> if I can remember correctly, education is the most powerful weapon by which you can use to change the world. And I was remembering uh, another quote by uh, another uh, scholar or a scholar, um, Ande, uh, what is his name? Andy McIndre, he said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> and I think it was Victor Hugo who once said, he who opens a school door closes a prison. He who opens a, a school door closes a prison. Knowledge. Of course, we would like to quote as devotees the Bhagavad Gita uh, ninth chapter Verse number two, 
this knowledge of, of the Gita is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge, and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed, as we know. Anyway, Parmananda's father was very grateful and happy for that donation. It's written that he thought, the Lord has given me both money and my first son. He has been very generous to me today. My new son is a bringer of wonderful fortune and his birth has brought me great joy. Therefore, I will bestow upon him the name Parmananda Das. So Parmananda means, or Parmananda Das, means in Sanskrit, servant of he who gives the greatest happiness, Krishna. Now, as a result of this generous donation <coughs> of the wealthy uh, businessman, um, Parmananda Das's family soon prospered in many ways. Parmananda Das himself is described um, something like a prodigy child in a transcendental way. It's said that he mastered the essential Vedic scriptures very early in his youth. So when he was 14, his father requested the Brahminical community to perform the Upanaya ceremony, which, as we know, is the you bestow upon the boy the sacred thread, and he gets the Gayatri mantra. So I was reading the news spread, and because this boy was so learned uh, at such a young age, Brahmanas from around the land came to attend the ceremony, as well as several kings and queens of nearby lands. And I was also reading that the ceremony went on for several months. <laughs> <coughs> So it's written that soon afterwards, Paramananda, uh, inspired in particular by his study of uh, the Grantara Srimad Bhagavatam, he started writing devotional poems and composing songs about Radha and Krishna and their divine abode in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And he very soon became famous for this and crowds of people would come regularly to hear his poetry, to hear his bhajans. A few years later, when his father suggested he get married, Paramananda said, and I quote here, O respected father, I have no desire to get married. Life is short and full of misery. My only desire is to spend time in glorification of Radha and Krishna and eventually return to their abode. Please just let me do my bhajan and not get entangled in the illusory energy of the Lord. So his father, concerned, replied, but my dear son, without the responsibility of marriage, how will you attain money, and wealth, and happiness in this world? So his son replied, Father, the only real profit gained through the acquisition of wealth is the ability to feed Vaishnavas and Brahmanas. I will never try to obtain money, but you will always have enough. So give up the seductive delusion of wealth, <laughs> Pita, and, and concentrate on the holy names of the Lord, on chanting the holy names of the Lord. So after some time, um, Paramananda Das, as a young man, he left home to uh, focus on his spiritual practices in Prayag, Prayag is known in ancient times as the city of Kashi. Kashi. Today it's known as Benares or Varanasi. <clears throat> so there he settled in a small Bhajan Kutir on the banks of the sacred Ganges, and he focused on composing poetry at this time uh, on the theme of the gopis' feelings of separation from Krishna. And soon this poetry became famous in that region as well. And the residents of Prayag, Varanasi, would often come to hear him read his poetry and sing his poetry. It had a, a big effect on their hearts. I, I think I've mentioned many times, like Prabhupada said, <clears throat> 
that the chanting of Hare Krishna, it's beneficial to hear it from anyone at any time, but it's especially beneficial if you hear the chanting of Hare Krishna from the lips of a pure devotee. So people became attracted. His poetry was um, touching their hearts. <coughs> now, at that time, some distance away, on the other side of the Ganges, in a small village called Adaila Gram, lived Balabacharya, along with his family. As we <coughs> mentioned previously, Balabacharya is the founder of the Balabacharya Sampradaya, uh, also known today as the Pushtimar. And at that time, Balabacharya was writing his commentary on the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, called in Sanskrit, Subodhini. Actually, Siddhar Prabhupada mentions this effort of Balabacharya in his purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila 1961. <coughs> Therein he writes, his Balabacharya's book, known as Shodasha Granta, and his commentaries on Vedat Vedanta Sutra, Anubhasha, and Srimad Bhagavatam, Subhudini, are very famous. And in that same verse, Krishnadas Kaviraj mentions that when Lord Chaitanya visited Payag, Balabacharya came to see him. The verse is Turiveni Upara Parbura Vasha Gharashdhana Dhubai Vasha Kaila Prabhu Shani Dhana. <coughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu selected his residence beside the confluence of the Ganges and the Jamuna at a place called Triveni. The two brothers, Rupa Goswami and Sri Balaba, selected their residence near the Lord's. So this Balaba is different than Balabacharya. It's, it's the, um, you could say, the brother of Rupa Goswami and um, Sanatana Goswami. Sometimes he was called Anupam and sometimes he was called Sri Balaba. The next verse, Sri Kali Balaba Bhat, Rahe Adaila Gram, Mahaprabhu Aila Sune Aila Tanrishdan. At that time, Sri Balaba Bhatta, meaning Balabacharya, was staying at Adaila Gram, just across the river. And when he heard that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had arrived, he went to his place to see him. Tenho Dandavat Kaila Prabhu Kaila Ali Ghana. Dui Jani Krishna Kata Haila Katashana. Balaba uh, Acharya, Balaba Bhattacharya, it's sometimes described, offered Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu his obeisances, and the Lord embraced him. After that, they discussed topics about Krishna for some time. Now, in Prabhupada's purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulila 1263, uh, he writes that on another day, Lord Chaitanya went to visit Balabacharya in his home, in a dialogram, on the other side of the river. <laughs> Paid a visit to him where he was living. Prabhupada writes, <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited the house of Balabacharya on the other side of Prayag, in a place known as the Dilagram. Now what's interesting, I was doing a lot of research uh, for this lecture, and I read that scholars of that period, they write that when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited Balabacharya, uh, Balabacharya was handed a plate of boga by, I imagine, one of the pujaris there in, their, in his home, to be offered to the household deity. But upon receiving that plate to be given to the deity, uh, Balabacharya got confused, seeing two supreme lords together in his house. <laughs> One in the deity form, the household deity, and the other in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So getting a little confused, transcendentally, he offered the plate of boga to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was supposed to go on the altar, but he handed it to Mahaprabhu. <laughs> All right, Krishna. <clears throat> so now, while living in the village of Adailagram, outside of Prayag on the other side of the river, Balabacharya had a servant named Kapura, 
who was uh, an orphan. I was reading that while living in a jungle area in Madhya Pradesh, both this boy's uh, father and mother were killed um, by a group of tigers. And at that time, at, at that on that day, leaving the then 14-year-old boy frightened and just crying on, on the bank of a river for three days, it's described. He didn't eat for three days. He was just crying. And at that time, Balabhachari was traveling and preaching around India. And a few days after Kapoor's parents had been killed, Balabhachari was crossing through that jungle area. And when he reached uh, the riverside, he saw the young Kapoor sitting and crying. So out of compassion, he told his associates to take the boy with them back to a dialogram. And the boy lived in the ashram near, near to uh, Balbacharya's home. And as he grew up, Kapoor was very grateful and began to serve Balabhacharya. And um, eventually he took initiation from him. So one day, Kapoor was filling water pots on the banks of the Ganges next to a dialogram when he heard uh, a devotee singing very sweet bhajans with, with a, a, a voice just imbued with devotion he'd never heard before coming from the other side of the river. He was hearing the singing coming from the other side of the river in Prayag. And he was so charmed he wanted to immediately drop everything <laughs> and go across the Ganges to associate with the sadhu. But he had services he needed to attend to, so he couldn't go. But later he inquired, that day he inquired from the local people as to who that singer was. And smiling broadly, a, a group of people, they said, uh, oh, that's the sadhu named Paramananda Das, a renowned poet and great devotee of the Lord who's settled in, in Prayag. He lives in a Bhajan Kutir there. And they also mentioned that because um, that particular day was a codice, he would be singing uh, Bhajans all night long until the sunrise the next morning in his Bhajan Kutir. So, uh, eager to meet him, Kapoor made a plan to cross the river by boat that evening after his services were done. But by the time he finished his seva and got to the riverbank, it was dark and all the boats had stopped working. But he was determined. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sava Shastokoi, Lava Matu Sadhu Sangha, Sava Hoi. Just a moment's association with a saintly person can begin one on the path of perfection. So determined, he swam all the way across the Ganges in the dark. Now, if you've ever been to Varanasi, to Prayag, you know the river's very wide there. I've been there many times, and it's flowing very swiftly. But he took the risk. When he got to the other side, he walked until he found the Bhajan Kutir of Paramananda Das. How did he find it? He followed his singing. Some distance away he could hear. So he just followed the singing, followed his heart, they say, right? To follow your heart. He, he followed his heart. He wanted Sadhu Sangha. He wanted to associate with this great, this great devotee. So he reached his Bhajan Kutir. And he was very humble. He, you know, it was dark. Maybe we can imagine one candle was burning or something. So he sat some distance away. He didn't want to disturb Paramananda. He, he just sat listening to him. And he was once again enchanted by his... his uh, his devotion. So he stayed the whole night, he stayed awake, absorbed in listening to him. And upon returning back to a dialogram on the other side of the river uh, the next morning, he went to his spiritual master, Balabhacharya, and he told him about this sadhu, Paramananda, who was living. In, uh, in Prayag, in his Bhajan Kutir, just <laughs> composing poetry and singing songs in glorification of the Lord. And when his spiritual master, Bal Bhacharya, heard about that, he said, oh, I'm very interested if I could meet this sadhu, Paramananda. 
So um, Kapura, he, he asked, but how will that happen? So Balabhacharya said something a little mystical. He, he smiled and he said, everything is done by the will of the Lord. Everything is done by the will of the Lord. So Kapura just took that, okay. So it's interesting. <coughs> that next night, Paramananda was sleeping in his bhajan kutir in Prayag when he had a dream. And in the dream, he saw Krishna sitting on the lap of Kapura, listening to his, to his Paramananda's kirtans. Now, he didn't know who Kapura was, but he saw him in his dream. And Krishna was sitting on his lap, and together they were listening to to his Parmananda's kirtans. So in the dream, when uh, Parmananda stopped singing, Krishna ran up to him. He saw Krishna running up to him. And Krishna said, my dear devotee, Parmananda, why did you stop singing? I was sitting on the lap of Kapura. He identified him. I, have, I was sitting on the, on the lap of Kapura and listening to your, to your bhajan. Actually, we swam across the river together <laughs> just to hear you sing. So then the dream broke. And upon waking, Paramananda asked the locals if they knew anyone named Kapura because it was such an amazing dream. He wanted to like meet him and share the dream with him. And he was informed that Kapura was in fact the servant of a great saint named Balabhacharya who lived across the Ganges in, in a village called a dialogram. So inspired by his dream, Parmanda crossed the river in a boat, and upon reaching a dialogram, that village, he looked around and inquired, and he found Kapura doing errands in the village uh, for his spiritual master, Balabhacharya. And he shared his dream with him. <laughs> you were in my dream. <laughs> and Kapura confirmed that he'd actually come to listened to Paramananda the night before, and he smiled when Paramananda told him that he envisioned Krishna uh, sitting on Kapura's lap, listening to him do his bhajan in his dream. So they spent time in deep discussions about the divine couple, Radha and Krishna. And at one point, Kapura mentioned that his spiritual master, Balabhachari, was, was nearby. And when Paramananda expressed a, a desire to meet Balabhacharya, Kapura took him for darshan with, with Balabhacharya. And at that meeting, Balabhacharya asked Paramananda to compose a song about Vipralamba Bhav, meaning the, when one feels separation from Krishna, like the Brajabhasis. So Paramananda spontaneously Remember, he was a prodigy child, and now he's, you know, maybe in his 20s or 30s or something, so <laughs> made more advancement. He spontaneously sang a song in loving devotion. And afterwards, Balabhacharya was just stunned. He was just stunned. He sat there. He couldn't speak, actually. And he expressed his, his deep appreciation. So this was actually the first of many of their meetings, to make a long story short. And eventually, Balabhacharya accepted Parmananda as his initiated disciple. And a couple of years later, Balabhacharya took Parmananda to Braj, to Vrindavan. Just imagine, he'd, he'd grown up singing about Radha and Krishna, the Brajabhasis, Vrindavan, the leaders, the pastimes, the abode, but he'd never been there. <laughs> he fell in love with Vrindavan outside Vrindavan. That gives us hope, those of us who are serving Srila Prabhupada and our movement in different parts of the world. It gives us hope. We can also develop love for Braj just by hearing, for example, the poetry of devotees like Parmananda. So he, he Balabhacharya took him to Vrindavan. It's described because he felt that was the best place for Paramananda to be inspired to continue his seva of writing poetry and singing for the Lord. And we know that too. We, 
Prabhupada has invited us to Vrindavan. Many times, or several times in his books, he mentions uh, his followers should come to Vrindavan because you get special inspiration there as many times as we can in our lifetimes. So in time, um, appreciating so much how um, Pramananda would sing for the Lord, um, Balabhacharya made him officially one of the Astachaps, or one of the eight principal poets and singers who would daily sing uh, for Gopal, the deity found by Madhavindapuri, who was being worshipped at that time on Govardhan Hill. Each of those eight singers had a particular time during the day. So that was the life of Paramananda. He continued to write poetry and sing daily for Gopal. In my research, there's no mention of any other historically extraordinary events in his life. But we understand as devotees that every minute of every day is an extraordinary time for every Vaishnav or Vaishnavi. For, you could say, with each step we take on the path of devotional service, Braj Bhakti, many spiritual wonders are, are revealed, are, are discovered, and there's more to come. That's very nicely described by Sri Rupa Goswami in his Utkalika Valari, text number six, one of my favorite verses of all time where he writes, O handsome, fragrant, tamal desire tree, blooming in Vrindavan forest, and embraced by the Madhavi vine of the goddess ruling this forest. O tree, the shade of whose glory protects the world from a host of burning sufferings. What wonderful fruits did the people find at your feet? What wonderful fruits to the people find at your feet. So much is to be discovered on the path of Krishna consciousness. It just gets better and better. So sadly, one day in the year 1583, when Parmananda was uh, approximately 90 years old, while sitting under a tree on the banks of Surabhikund, Govardhan Hill, and singing uh, Gopal's glories, while looking upwards towards the moving flag in Gopal's temple up on the hill, he left his body and returned to the spiritual world. So, of course, I think it would be most appropriate to conclude today with some of his poetry so we can properly understand him. We've heard, you know, historically his life, but I think to, to hear his poetry is to know him. Just like Sri Prabhupada said one time, if you want to know me, read my books, read his purports. You'll know who is Sri Prabhupada. So let's hear some of the poetry of Paramananda. So we just don't think of him as an historic personality, but we can feel very close to him. And we can also get his association <laughs> through his poetry. And maybe it will also touch our hearts as well. We can do so to try to experience just a drop of the love he had for Krishna, Krishna's associates, and the transcendental land that is Sri Vindavan Dham. He writes, Lalita says to Krishna, O Krishna, our queen, Sri Radha wears a gold-embedded chowder, whereas you only wear a black woolen chowder, filled with dust from the cows. Our Radha adorns her head with a diamond-studded crown of victory, whereas you wear a turban of torn cloth. Our queen wears necklaces of countless gemstones, which sparkle like different shades of the moon, whereas you wear a simple forest flower garland, which has no scent. Our queen dresses in skirts of opulence, whereas you dress in a cloth of poverty, Krishna. She holds a stick of royal power, whereas you hold a simple bamboo flute. O Krishna, 
Peacocks dance under nose rings, whereas you only have one feather on your head. So he concludes, The queen of Braj is Radha, whereas the son of Nanda is her servant for many lifetimes. <laughs> this great poet also has written, <clears throat> Look, today the buttermilk made from yogurt by the gopis has become the rarest thing to achieve even by the creator of this world, Lord Brahma. Just see, the humble gopis are distributing that buttermilk to everyone. It is the very Adhara Amrita, the nectar of Krishna's lotus lips. Also he wrote, That lord of the fourteen worlds, while ruling in Dwarka, eats fifty-six sumptuous food items, thirty-six types of special dishes, a hundred and eight types of different drinks, and many types of snacks every day. Yet that same Lord hankers for drinking a handful of buttermilk prepared by the Braja Gopis of Vrindavan. The other day I was thinking, I wonder what Krishna's flute sounds like. Will I ever get to hear it? <laughs> I was wondering, if, like, what will it sound like? And then I, I found this poem by Paramananda Das, which gives a hint of what happens to those souls fortunate enough to hear that flute. When or oh, when will that day be ours? He writes, listen, O Saki, when Krishna places the flute to his sweet nectarian lotus lips, at that time all people, demigods and living beings, stop breathing in excitement. As he starts playing it, filling it with his transcendental breath, all living beings and demigods become intoxicated. When he comes to the fifth note, all the ecstatic symptoms start to appear in those fortunate enough to hear it. And when he plays the seventh and highest note of his flute, he enlivens the very soul of everyone. O Saki, what more can I say? With the last note of his flute song, all the kings place the royal crowns at the feet of that flute. Beautiful ladies surrender their beauty to it. Demigods offer their powers to it, and Saraswati becomes a maidservant to it. I, Paramananda Das, also offer my everything to that flute, which can drown the entire world in ecstasy. <laughs> we must all offer our prostrated obeisances to that divine personality and thank him that 500 years later, his poem is stirring some emotions in our heart. We're very, very grateful and grateful to Sridhar Prabhupada for introducing Vrindavan, Radha and Krishna, their associates, and all these wonderful personalities who can inspire us. Hare Krishna. So we have a few more poets to go, <laughs> and um, I'll be back uh, next Friday. Shishi Gorani Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shamashundar Ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Shishi Gorani Tai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtanya Ki, Nitai Gaur Pivnandi, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe Sham. Glories to Sri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.